richer than the Emperor himself. Dude, how long have you been standing there? An hour. An hour? I've mastered the ability of standing so incredibly still that I've become invisible to the eye. Watch. All right, we're gonna be talking about Dune. I have been wanting to watch this movie for years. Years. Centuries. And I'm like, okay, you know what? The next movie's coming out. Might as well get off my ass and start watching it. Cause everyone's on that Dune -ussy. Sorry, that's so stupid. <laughs> Let's go. So there's this narration and exposition about this emperor and there's these sand people on this planet, the whole bunch of dunes on it, which is I'm guessing what the name Dune stands for. Oh snap, I just realized that Dune is spelled with a whole bunch of the same shape in different directions. For a lot of this character's runtime, he's having this wet dream about Zendaya. And apparently Zendaya is into him too. What would Tom Holland think? Yes! He doesn't know what these dreams mean, but gotta be important. And his mother, the woman from Silo, tries to teach him all these magic tricks, like using the voice. Give me the water. Oh my god, what is that? Oh my god! What is that? With great power comes great responsibility. Where is she? I like all the mothers like, <laughs> that was cute. You almost did it, but she didn't. Like, really? What is this preacher? <laughs> this guy is the prince, Paul, of Atreides. He reads a lot. He keeps dreaming about the girl, the Fremen or Freeman, or whatever, however you, whatever, it doesn't matter. We learn that Spice is the driving force behind this movie. Be hazardous. For the Fremen, Spice is the sacred hallucinogen, which preserves life and brings enormous health benefits. For the Imperium, Spice is used by the navigators of the Spacing Guild to find safe paths between the stars. Without Spice, interstellar travel is impossible. So Spice is the most valuable substance in the whole universe. But you'd think with how valuable it is, and how advantageous having the health benefit effects are, people would put a little bit more time into ensuring that the mining process is as efficient as possible. We'll get to that later. I love me some sci-fi, but just to break it down, this is like hyper-religious, with all these messianic prophecies. We've got the main character's mother, who's a member of the Many Gesserit religion, let's just call it culty witches, and Paul's father, who is a good and fair leader. The Emperor's envoy is like, listen, the desert planet over there where we mine the spice, we want you to take control of it. Then we got Aquaman, call Drogo, uh, freaking, you know, yeah. And if you're a Newfoundland, you should come down to Jack Axis. Yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> So this guy's name is Duncan, and Paul, our main character, tells him, mm, I've been dreaming about you, baby, that you die and shit, so can I come with you? Uh, fuck no. Then we get a minor flashback to his dream of Zendaya, and I'm like, bro, <laughs> we're talking about Duncan's death, and you gotta think about Freeman Puss in the same recap? That's like me being scared that one of my brothers is gonna die, and then remembering my wet dream alongside his death. Like, c time and place. And I know your arguments are probably gonna be, Well, he didn't like the girl, let's see her like that. And I'm sorry, I beg to differ, but even if that were the case, it's just weird him thinking about Duncan's death and then thinking about her in the same line of thought. You know, weird artistic choice, but whatever. No, you're gonna die! You are gonna die! I guarantee it! We get some dreary scenes, it's like they're shot out of an AI music video about emo feelings and depression. Paul and his father are at the graves of their forefathers, talking about their futures, and Paul basically doesn't want to become the next ruler, and his father's all like, I was like you when I was your age. If you don't want to do it, I love you anyway. <laughs> right, okay. There's some strong reverse psychology there. How many times do we have to tell you? <laughs> I always wondered why people do those exaggerated moves. Like, it looks cool, but in the time you're spending doing your triple pirouette or whatever the hell moves that is, somebody could just slice you in half and swing their sword. They're like literally looking at you, watching their watch, and wondering if you're done what the frick you're doing. Like, look, you spin the sword, and then half the time the sword, while you're turning, the person can just shove you in your groin with their sword. Like, you, you waste all that energy turning the back on the enemy momentarily so that they can have a chance to kill you. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, people get away with that in anime, but I don't think they- Look at- Bro, you're splitting there going- No, what, they're, you're falling now. The minute you touch the ground, you're dead. Dude, your pelvis is split open like that one guy in that video of that ski guy. I wish I didn't see that video. Holy shit. So Thanos starts- 
training him, and they show these shield things that they're shields. They give you some time to not feel things if somebody is doing something. Like, what is the point of them, though? Like, I know I'm nitpicking here, but just, just, just hear me out. The shield works at 100% when you're barely touching it. But then when it presses into you, it's like, oh my god, I can't do this. What is the point of it, then? The slow blade penetrates the sh All someone has to do is hold something there long enough and you're dead. Like, it's just prolonging death. I mean, what does it give you an extra few seconds to kind of react? But by that time, if they're already at the point where they're holding you like this, bro, you're dead. You're, you're deceased. Stop. And you can make the argument that this is just for training purposes so they can see that they've died, but we see the soldiers using this later on in the movie. <laughs> Anyway, the idea is that Paul and his father need to go over to Arrakis to take over the spice binding thing and be nice to the Fremen. Unlike these Harkonnen people, invisible Drax and his Naga snake uncle penguin person, freaking evil beetle bruisers. Oh cool, why is the emperor done this? Scary. Paul's mom wakes him up and she's like, the Reverend Mother is here and she's now the true sayer to the emperor, so you better behave yourself and do everything she says. Mom, what if she wants to stick her finger up my ass? Really, bitch? I did say everything she says, did I not? So he goes in, and this woman from out of a freaking horror movie is like, you're so disrespectful, I hate you. Stick your hand in, and if you feel any pain or flinch or do anything, I will kill you, because why not? No security needed for this dude. Even though he's a freaking prince, where are the security guards, really? And you know, I thought his mother was the queen, but it's later on explained that she's literally just the guy, the king, or the ruler's concubine. Why does she have all of the power and autonomy me to just go about. What if she snaps one day and kills her son? Mm -hmm. You like my poison needle? I must use it on you because you have a poison needle. I hate you. So the mother's terrified waiting out there, but you're like literally a slave to your religion. Paul puts his hand in the box, starts feeling a lot of pain. face looks like the face of a kid that's getting spanked or something and he's just sick and tired of his mother's shit and he's like you know what I know you want me to cry I know you want me to cry so on purpose I'm not gonna I'm gonna make you think I'm a possessed person I will not cry no matter how hard you beat me and then the mother shows you and she spanks you harder until you start crying anyway but like if you're really really angry you can get through the spanks it just makes you matter and then she gets mad at you and punishes you more and grounds you just because of that shit no one can tell me that's not some weird psychologically messed up shit right there. Mm hmm I passed the test. So the old woman's like, you're having dreams that will happen at some point, right? And apparently his mother went against these people by breeding the Messiah. And this woman's sexist. You have to go that far. You chose to train him in the way, in defiance of our rule. He wields our power. He had to be tested to the limits. So much potential wasted in a male. If he's of your religion and he's going to benefit your religion at some point, why why would it matter what's between his legs? The son heard everything and he's like, you're using me for politics. I'm trying to create the Messiah. They make it to the planet Arrakis. <laughs> Paul recognizes that everyone's calling him Lisan al Gaib, some the Messiah person, which means the Bene Gesserit people, the cult people, have been at work here trying to brainwash everyone into their religion. I love these dragonfly things, man. They're so cool. Shifremen. You know the ancient tongues? I know many things. It's a crisp knife. Do you know its meaning? Um... <laughs> The mother usually does this weird sign language thing with her fingers, but she only uses one hand. And there's only so many ways that your fingers can go in that position. I mean, is this something that they're making up on the fly? How many words does a specific hand position using one hand and flexing your fingers until they look like they're breaking have? To me, it looks like a cuttlefish trying its hardest to get away from the current of the water, but it just makes no sense. And she does this several times throughout the movie. It's a make. <laughs> Okay, wouldn't want that person to be my housekeeper. Looks like some keys are playing in the wrong tone there. By the way, characteristic of the Fremen is that their eyes are blue, like weirdly blue, no matter what they look like. I don't know date palms could even be found out here. These aren't indigenous. They can't survive without me. Each one of these drinks every day the equivalent of five men. Damn. A little wasteful, don't you think? I mean, if they can't survive without you, and they use so much water to be kept alive, what is their point? 
20 palm trees. 100 lives. We remove them. Save the water. No, no, no. These are sacred. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I don't get religion sometimes. You can save actual people's lives. No, 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 no. Why would we do that? These are godly. They're important. But they need you to survive, though. Doesn't matter. Okay. Like, do they have a function outside of them just being pretty and you wanting to keep them alive? Old dream. <laughs> Paul's face. <laughs> He's like, bro, are you good? <laughs> oh my lord. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's like the only explanation that we get. Like, there is no logic to it whatsoever. It's just... <laughs> Oh my god, no matter how many times I rewatch that, it will always be freaking comical to me. Like, no other- that's- okay. So Paul is watching his, like, projection encyclopedia of Fremen crossing the desert using weird motions so they don't attract sandworms because the sandworms and the do- the desert, sorry, are attracted by rhythmic sounds. That's how they hunt their food. And then Paul hears something weird. Landscape. It's a little metal mosquito thing. And I get if he was sleeping, it would be easy. And maybe, you know, to be fair, this thing is pretty small. Not terrifying. It's not small enough, though. He notices it. You would, you notice an insect in your room. Why would you not notice this? He tries to hide himself through the, uh, projection as the thing tries to find him. How did he catch it so fast? Is he the flash? It was, it was moving really fast. How did he? Okay, stop. Housekeeper comes in and he's already killed it. Look, it flies towards her so fast and he's like, I'm gonna go grab it. Oh, I saved you, you crazy bitch. Oh, it's like a very ineffective way of killing someone unless you know for certain the person is sleeping because otherwise... You know what I mean? So we're told it's a hunter seeker. A hunter seeker? That's literally what it says. Why would you call it a hunter seeker? When you're hunting something, you're seeking to kill it. So like, I, I don't get it. Is it like a double hunter? What kind of failed at the name, but whatever. The operator must be nearby. Hawk and an agent was submitted into that hole six weeks ago. Ran the hunter seeker through a water pipe inside the walls. Uh huh? I kept racking my brain as to why this guy was dead, but it's possible he might have taken his own life while he found them trying to dig him through the wall. I, I don't know. Feels like there's a lot of scenes missing out of this. Sorry, I feel today. There's no excuse. You have my resignation. You're the prime subject. Time's up. I'm a demand. They tried to take the life of my son. I don't give a damn about your honor. You want absolution? Go catch some spies. I like how this guy is like... Let me, let me go before he gets the idea to kill me. Because <laughs> most, most rulers would do that. They'd be like, you didn't do your job? You're, you're dead. And this guy's like, um, I fucked up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. So, cause I'm not worthy. <laughs> oh God, I love it. What the hell is that? At first I thought that the back end of this thing was his head. Then I realized that the head is the thing eating. So this insect literally has an ass cleft. Why would it need one? Like, that's just weird. Why does the back of an insect thing look like a human ass crack? Like, I just don't understand that design choice. But is it it? Why does it have fingers? Ew! Then she tells it to Lee. Ew, gross. Turns out that the, the cult woman is working with Mr. Snake Naga guy. Bro, his stomach is gigantic. Alice Harkonnen would never dream of violating the sanctity of your order. I'll give you my word. Anytime an evil villain that sounds like a robot and looks like a weird, it's like if a pillowcase came to life. Dude looks like pancake batter when you embalm it and then put air in it. It just looks uncanny. And maybe that's by design. He's a good villain though. Well, the bottom half of his face is falling off. Disgusting. And I shall not. But Arrakis is Arrakis. And the desert takes the weak. My desert. Okay, so he has a hose going up his asshole. I mean, I there, I don't even know. Because half the time you see his legs, is that his tail? What's happening here? Why are hips so big? Like, why? Ew. Gross. I don't know. This thing is turned... Mm. So basically, this evil guy, even though he gave his word to the witch that Paul and his family would not be harmed, he's still gonna kill him anyway, but he's not gonna directly kill him. He's gonna let the desert kill them. So they're thinking about all the stuff they have to do, filling all the crates of spice. 
And then the No Country for Old Men guy comes in with his deeper voice and his big bottom half of his face. He clearly doesn't like the Atreides guy. He's like, don't, don't come upon our land, bro, or we'll cut your feet off. Sort of, kind of, but not, but yes. And he sees Paul and he's like, I recognize you. Everyone that Paul runs into, it's like he's this giga chat and everybody just falls at his feet like, oh my God, you're so special, even though you don't look it at all. Then we meet this woman who I do like. And this scene is very awkward. You've worn a still suit before? No, it's my first time. Your desert boots are fitted slip fashion at the angles. Who taught you to do that? Seen right way. <laughs> so let me get this straight. You think that it's possible that he's the Messiah because he taught tied his shoes a different way the way your people tie his shoes that was your first thought oh my god he must be the freaking godly messiah dude not that it's possible that he could be lying and he in saying that he just thought it looked better that way and it's more possible that he's educated and actually has met other firm people and he knows how they tie their shoes or not that it could also be possible that he has a higher intellect and he just knows efficiency and just like the first person who came up with the idea idea of tying their shoes that way in the desert there could also be other people with the same idea being that there's millions upon millions of people can't be that de facto must be godlike must be the messiah you see how stupid people are sometimes i feel like the movie is making a show of this like trying to explain how gullible people are and how far people will go to believe shit so they fly over the dunes finally where the woman is basically like their guy and she's telling them it's worm territory down there so you don't want to go down there they'll eat your ass and they see the dust cloud it's one of the spice harvesters and here's something that doesn't make any sense to me and maybe i'm missing some context or something which you know you're supposed to explain in the movies you're not supposed to have read the books to get the point because this is a movie adaptation but anywho she claims that there are worms that travel towards the harvesters but they get closer to the surface before they attack they're drawn to rhythmic noises and then this guy thanos is like well why don't we just shield the crawlers <laughs> Yep. To which the woman says a shield is a death sentence in the desert. Why? I don't know. She just says it attracts the worms and drives them into a killing frenzy. Why it does this? Not one damn clue. It's just heavily convenient, isn't it? So they call people because this is something that happens all the time. They call the other guys who are working and they're like, okay, we're gonna go pick up the harvester and move it. If these worms, if this is worm territory and it's drawn by rhythmic noises, wouldn't that mean that the minute the harvester turns on and starts doing its rhythmic machine noises that there would be worms upon it in an instant? Seriously? Then we discover that uh, there are methods in which you can create noises to draw the worms away. So why don't they do that? I don't understand. Like, okay, no weapons can can do whatever with it. Why don't you make something much louder or build something with rhythmic noises or put things down with rhythmic noises so that you can attract the worms? How is it even possible for them to harvest spice at all? Like you would have to be picking up this thing every minute, two minutes before one of these things come. And then what? Can you see where the worms are? If you can't detect where their worms are, if they're close or sleeping right under the area, there is no possible way this could even be remotely efficient enough to put harvesters of this size down on the desert to get spice. Really, look how long, <laughs> look how long it takes for them to, to dock this thing and lift it up. And then one of it breaks. Like, why didn't they check to make sure that this was done properly? Or why don't they have a backup in case one breaks? For a job that is depending so much on something so valuable, you'd think they'd have backup after backup after backup. But no, this one thing breaks and everyone starts panicking. Oh my God, we're gonna die. The worm's gonna eat us. Now these people who probably wouldn't have been there have to go in and save them because they don't have backups and protocols while pretending that they do. It's the stupidest thing I have ever seen. I like the concept. I like the idea. Of course, it's for drama sake because now the worm is coming upon them. And conveniently, it's only one worm. Are worms territorial? What's to stop other worms from not descending on this area from a radial output? Why is it just one worm? Wouldn't every worm from all around hear the rhythmic noises? I mean, this is basically tremors, right? It just feels weird. And you think that they would make defense strong enough to take down these worms. And even if they don't, still very inefficient, you wouldn't make a whole other equipment specifically for attracting worms. Strange. So while they're saving people, Paul ends up having a weird type of vision and he spaces out and Thanos goes to get him. And he's like, I recognize your foot, old man. Oh, I'm still <laughs> Harvester is taken because they can't 
can't save it and you see how big the worm is. Oh no. Bye bye harvester and all the spice that you just wasted all that time harvesting even though it didn't have to happen but whatever. People's brains like, apparently don't function very well in the year 10,000 such and such. Hey. Cannot take such risks. Yes, sir. You have responsibilities. Guys, I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again. I mean, you took a risk too, as the ruler, by going and helping those people. He's just following your example, but whatever. So Paul's dad is like, if I don't get spice production back on track, everyone gonna die. Almost feels like he's being sabotaged. Doctor Yue thinks that Paul's fine, and because the spice has to loosen the genetic effects, it's like a drug that you take and then you see dead people. His exposure to it just means that he was just exposed to it, not necessarily learned. So he remembers his vision and guess what the vision's about? Of course. Yes, of course. You every time I ask you this, you can drink and probably you'll win the game, guessing that the answer is this girl. Mm -hmm. But then the vision has something additional to it. There's a bloody knife, almost like it seems as though she kills him. So she's like, yeah, that can't be. He says it was a vision. It wasn't just the spice, and he knows he has a vision. It's like he knows that she's pregnant. And she's like, How could you know that? I barely know that. It can't possibly be that your behavior and your appetite's different and he's picking up on that and his subconscious recognizes that or you have a slight smell. He's very educated. Sure, he would know what the signs are that a woman's pregnant. Pregnant. Meanwhile, the Harkonnens are planning an attack to the Atreides people, and there is a really big attack on the Atreides people. They just are not prepared for this. How could you not see the Harkonnen people are going to fight back, being as they were very savage and have a reason and a motive to want to attack you? Like, the Atreides people were just not prepared. It was so shameful, and these people come down on these... I don't know what they're coming down on, but they're coming down. Mr. Yue uses a poison quill to kill the king slowly, and he's like, I'm sorry, bro. My wolf, women, woman, they caught my woman. I gotta, I gotta save her. It is what it is, bro. I can't screw you, so I gotta pick and choose. Like, when you agree to work for certain people, don't you give up certain whatever? But he says, this is what you're gonna do. You can help me out. <laughs> if you... You, you chew on this tooth I'm gonna give you, it will release poison, and hopefully if you choose your right chance, you can kill the Baron, which is the leader Naga snake ass person. How could this person think? I mean, I guess it's all hope and whatnot, but you must know the type of people these are. That if you betray your king or whomever, and you come back and try to collect your wife, you, you can't possibly believe they're gonna give her back to you. Like, what did you expect? But I can't even blame him. I can't blame him because I don't know if I do the same thing in my position. Like, when you love someone, desperation clouds your judgment. You can't just be like, well, she's dead anyway, not gonna save her. Like, that's not your thinking. Your line of thinking is, that's the love of my life, or that's my child, or I have to try. In the very slight 1% chance that these people will show me mercy, even though I know they don't. What Dr. Yue does say is that he'll promise to do what he can for Paul, and he takes the king's ring. A lot of the generals of Atreides are executed, and then we get the scene with badass Khal Drogo over here, and this is why I had a problem with the whole shield scene earlier. Because clearly, the shields don't freaking work. I like how he runs like he's too big for his body. See? Like... <laughs> That's all it takes. Duncan tries to find Paul and his mom, but they're gone. They've been kidnapped. And just like the Baron said, the plan is to drop them over the desert so that when they face the truth sayer about what happened to them, they can say, we didn't kill him. Damn, like the amount of reinforcements that the Harkonnen people had on the Atreides, like they were not, this was a massacre. This was like the Red Wedding. Duncan kills everybody in sight in the vicinity and he's like, get away. And they just get away. Like, why? What? I don't understand. These soldiers are so good. There's three of them. Does he have special powers? Like, what's going on? Why didn't they? Well, the dude's got height and muscle on this guy. And the freaking gigantic Goliath is just like, all right, I guess you can take the plane. <laughs> Lower guy, what is going on? So he narrowly escapes and freaking like a scene from out of Godzilla versus Kong. Well, this movie came before that movie, right? They probably took it from this. Cause look at it. This looks like the scene from Godzilla versus Kong. Anyway, while Paul and his mother are tied up, the Harkonnen people are like, I would really like to taste some of them cheeks. And Paul's not liking this, and we think that something really powerful is going to happen. I give her a long goodbye. Don't you dare touch my mother. <laughs> 
people are kidnapped and in these situations they feel like they're in a position to be making threats you realize you're just amping them up and making them want to right that's just weird now that they've gotten to you they're gonna make it a point to do exactly that you can't give up your ace that easily but i can't really blame him because the anger that would consume me would probably cause me to be stupid too how the frick like i said with these sign language how how your hand is tied up how do you get that oh <laughs> okay Remove her gag. <laughs> so this guy, I'm like, um, okay, I guess we're doing this. And then he gets up like he's about to do it, <laughs> and he punches. Paul. He's like, "Shut up, bro." Now, if you know, if you know he has the ability to do this, like he knows the reason why she's gagged. Apparently, is because he knows that the mother has the ability to do the voice. She taught her son how to do it. And he just showed on some level that he knows how to do it. Why would you risk leaving him ungagged? That just makes no sense to me. How are you conveying this through using one hand downwards where your fingers are not flexible enough to make that much range of mo- Are you a squid? Was this intentional? Like, did the book initially have squid people with squid fingers and octopus lips? Because there is no way in hell that she can have a whole language that she can just do with her hand opening and closing and the five fingers, like, no way. Pitch? What, what's the right word for that in sign language using just this? So they're getting ready to throw Paul out and Paul is drawing on his inner peace and whatnot and we're like, ooh, he's gonna use the power now and finally it works because these people are idiots. This is so heavily convenient to the point where it's hilarious. Now you have me thinking, did she use the voice on her husband, the ruler, in order to get him to make her, like, he had said before he died, you know, all that whole thing went down, that he wished he had married her. Mm -hmm. Maybe she didn't want all the responsibility that came with a queen or something. But how many times? I would be wondering, with that ability, how did she ever use it on me at any point to gain power? Like, I would never trust her. And knowing how she is, like, dude, you knew her son. This is her son. And he already showcased at least a minor ability to do this, and you left him ungagged. This is so stupid. <laughs> this movie's great, though. So they land the dragonfly plane, and something happens. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, what's the motto? And she, she says they crippled the ship. Somewhere, don't know how, but I guess other Harkonnens realized that the ship was hijacked by these people. So conveniently now they have to get out. So let me get this straight, right? <laughs> they have the ability, these people, to remote control cripple a ship. Meaning wherever anyone is, like imagine someone steals your car. From wherever you are, you can say, oh, someone stole my car or the person I intended to have drive the car is no longer driving the car. Oop, beep, just press this button and it just cripples the ship. So um, when Duncan got away with the same type of ship, why did they not have the remote ability to cripple his ship? When he was all like, get away from it, and they let him have it, why did they not cripple the ship then? Which they showcase in the scene I just showed you they had the ability to do all along. What in the mundo? Also, if this woman had her voice all along, right? Before they gagged her, I mean, yeah, I get it. Maybe they, they got the drop on her or whatnot. But unless they gagged her in her sleep and she didn't know, wouldn't she have had time to say stop and give orders? Like, she bit the people's hand. She had the ability to do that when they... I don't know, just a lot of things are just heavily convenient in this movie. Anyway, they had captured the king and he's still dying, but very slowly. And he's waiting for the right moment. And while this freaking walrus stuffs his face. By this time, Philo Woman and Paul realize that Dr. Yue is the one that had betrayed their father and them. But he also helped them get away, sort of, kind of. I like how they made this guy so insignificant when they introduced him as just the doctor. And then he just goes full blown to like, this is a very integral character of of which many scenes happen to be missing for character development, but whatever. So he's like, where's my wife? And the, you know, the king is still listening. And snake ass baron dude slithers over or not. Like what in the world? Those are feet. He has no tail. What is happening? 
happening right now? His belly enters the shot first while he's still chewing, which looks so disgusting. Don't touch me with that. It's gross. I said I'd set her free. <laughs> oh, man. I, you know the first thought I had? He's eating her. He's eating her. Like, I had a feeling. They don't ever say that, but you know what I mean? Like, that would have been the ultimate thing. Like, oh, by the way, you want a meal? <laughs> Why don't you sit down and, you know, before you... I think Dr. Yue already knew. And this guy's like, I did say I was going to set her free and I'll set you free too. I already knew he was dead. Before any of this even entered the equation, the minute he decided to betray his king, I knew Dr. Yue was dead. So floaty big guy is like, your son is dead. Your concubine is dead. Your bloodline is gone forever. Just saying, this guy is an idiot because... Your house Atreides and Paul is like what? Anywhere from 15 to 21? It's kind of hard to hey, say. You had all this time to make another child and you just now got your wife pregnant if that's even your kid. Like what What were you waiting? <laughs> You're a king, right? Or a ruler, whatever the hell he's supposed to be. Why were you waiting for so long and begging all your eggs in one yolk or, or yoking all your eggs in a basket? You know what I mean? That was very irresponsible. He should have been pumping his wife full of milk year after year, or at least every two years. I mean, you could have had like, what, five kids by now? Okay, so the Baron, I guess he whispers something because he wants the Baron to get closer. You're already very close. Why would you not have already activated your shield the moment you got close enough to him? Why would you not always have your shield activated? Do these things run on lithium batteries and they need to be charged? I don't understand. There are several times throughout this movie when people forget to put their shields on in dangerous situations, you know, so we can have a little bit of dramatization. Or just conveniently show the audience that, by the way, I'm in a dangerous situation with an enemy right in my vicinity, but I'm not gonna have my shield on, even though I know I have a lot of enemies, and I could particularly have a traitor in my midst. Just seems very irresponsible. If I were in this position, I'd have a shield activated all the time. All the time. Like, me. You have freaking little remote control bug things that can kill people by sticking their needle dicks inside of people's necks. Why would you not always have your shield activated? And if they need to be charged, why not have sets of like 12 of them where you can just put one on immediately and take the other one off after you put the other one on? What is wrong with these people? I love how they left their baron in there. They were like, screw the fucking king, bro. We need to live. <laughs> they didn't even go there like, mm, he's dead. Oh, well. <laughs> even though he's still in the middle of dying. <laughs> there are many freaking traitors. So yeah, since the ring is here, Paul and his mom know that the king is dead. Caltro, sorry, Duncan is very angry with his Fremen woman because he figures she knows what was going on. Meanwhile, back at the baron's place, he is floating in the air because I guess the poison doesn't rise. You know how freaking terrifying that is? They're probably like, damn it, I wish he was dead. Back to Paul and his mom. Turns out there's spice in the tent. He's super angry at his mother, but he has another wicked vision, of course. Her, she's in it. And there's a war, and this person is doing all these inefficient moves that are so dumb and so unnecessary. It looks like, look at this. This does not have the fluidity and the expertise of someone who knows how to fight. What in the world? Why would you just randomly open your helmet? <laughs> this movie's so comical. I love it. He looks so dumb. <laughs> Bodies piling up, people calling his name, and he's like, oh no, people wage wars in my father's name. I become an evil person. What have you done to me, mother? Ew, look at this face. Ooh. I, I know he's sad, but that's one hell of a screenshot. Damn, if Snuffleupagus was a person. Still don't know what role she plays. Doesn't matter. Duncan reunites with Paul and the others. They're holed up in this place. The Fremen woman is helping them. Duncan's like, YOLO, I got this. You'll be all right, my king. Duncan probably knows he's gonna die. And he's already addressed Paul as the new king. So shields don't do shit, but Duncan has one last hurrah and he's like, ah, oh, I'm gonna scream and announce my presence. You know, whatever. You could have cut down so much more of them had you not given away your position. So you were doing it as a war cry. I get it. But now, now, like, now you've just told all of them to, to face you and be aware that you're going to attack them. Not Nice, nice try though. Like, look, look at all their shields failing. Look, look, look at all their shields doing absolutely jack. 
the Fremen woman gets them out and she's like, I'll meet up with you. And I'm like, really? Okay, we're not gonna see her again. But props to her, while Paul and his mom are getting away in the dragonfly, she makes a thumper to call the worm to her, the device that makes small rhythmic noises. See, that exists that the Atreides people could have used on a much larger scale to distract the worms so they could use the harvester or build equipment that has a non-rhythmic tone. You had all this time. It's not like this is the first time they're harvesting spice. That part was just weird to me. Like you have the technology to do this mechanically. Why would you not do mm. The worm is coming to her and I think she's planning on writing it because there has been some books that showcase women writing the worms, but it's too late and they stab her in the back. She's like, you know what? <laughs> yes, I betrayed my emperor. I serve only one master though. Shai Holud, I guess that's the worm. So here's another inconsistency, right? This is still worm territory, sort of, not really. The minute after she had this thumper, which is a very small thing, a worm in the distance immediately came to the area. This is worm territory, which I'm gathering to mean there is a bunch of worms in the vicinity, right? That's what that means. It comes right away. So how is it that when the harvesters were put down and people had to walk and do all that stuff, they were able to set it up? But not even that. The minute the harvester turns on and starts doing its thing, why would worms not be on it immediately if it's in the middle of worm territory? Huh? Anyway, she's like, boom, boom, rhythm. And the worm immediately teleports to their location. It, it just forgets the thumper is there. I mean, even if they took it out, the quickness, like the quickness, the time scaling in this, when the worm reacts and when it doesn't react is just crazy to me in this movie. And she dies like a badass. She's like, okay, you know what? If I gotta die, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Because I took you guys with me and the worm eats them. Very inefficient. So if the worm sees a very tiny, small creature, like how much of the, the desert's not a very, you know, prolific place in terms of food. So it's spending a lot of energy just to swallow little grains of sand. Cause that's the equivalent of what those people's sizes are. The harvester I get, like if, especially if it can synthesize that stuff, but it's just like, what would it eat other than that and other worms? Well, Paul and his mom must get away from the other people using the dragonflies. And then while they're in the storm, that's going to certainly bring them death. Something tells Paul, don't fear, let go this guy who was a Fremen. And he's like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, sure. YOLO, bitch. We're gonna die anyway, so might as well not control the ship. Okay. Drax meets with his uncle, and he tells him his uncle who's still alive and looks like absolute ass. He looks like those cursed animations that have the body physics of freaking jello spaghetti, and you look at it and you just feel all wrong inside. And no matter how they move, they just look disgusting. <laughs> So there are certain 100%, even though you shouldn't leave anything up to that kind of guarantee, that these people are dead because nothing survives that storm. And Drax is like, what about the Fremen? And he's like, kill them all, what do I care? I'm drinking my oily fuel, diesel, whatever the shit he's in. And so they're above the storm and Paul lands successfully. One thing I will give this movie is how things look when they land from their perspective. That's actually pretty cool. I felt like I was in the ship with them. I like that. He has to protect his mom now. They put on the suits and there are worms in the area because it's worm territory, like tremors. I don't know what it is about dudes wearing like ninja mask outfits like Sub-Zero. For some reason, everybody who wears getups like this looking like ninjas, they all look good. Why? See, it just makes people automatically look bad Ass. Ew, no. Mm -mm, no, okay, no, maybe not everybody. Never mind. I think it's for certain people <laughs> with like a certain brow ridge and eye thing going on. He looks better with a mask on. That is totally a compliment. I mean, well. Anyway. So Paul remembers his dream when Duncan was alive. Now he's not. And he keeps on seeing things from his dream, like the knife and this dude saying that a friend will help him and the friend turning out to be the woman that he keeps dreaming about. So they walk like stupid people so they won't alert the worms, but they have to keep moving just in case. My question is if they're sitting on the sand, completely still, and these worms hunt via vibration, wouldn't they be giving off a slight vibration with their pulse coursing through their body? That's rhythmic. Their breathing is rhythmic. Doesn't that translate into the ground? Oh well. Hey. He's from sand. 
Hello, motherfucker. Why? I don't understand. I feel like there's so much information that we are missing conveniently. It's drum sand. Why would you keep beating on it rhythmically if you know that? Why not just make a very odd motion. And now you're running, this thing is going to catch up to you. Now you're doing rhythmic moves. Why not just keep doing non-rhythmic moves? I mean, I guess they panicked or whatnot. What is drum sand supposed to do? I don't know. You sound like a drum. But if you're walking over it in the same manner that you walk over the regular sand, not creating a rhythmic pattern, wouldn't it still have the same effect? <laughs> Okay, so the uncircumcised animal looks down at him and stops. If he could take his head out of the sand, why wouldn't he just smash whatever it is is in front of him that he knows is in front of him? He obviously knows where they are, but they're on base, right? So he can't get them. <laughs> Ew, stop twinking. I didn't uh, know that that was an option. So they said someone set off a thumper. Was it to attract the worm or was it to detract the worm? Like distract it from them? I don't know. So the mother does a stupid ass random or the, sorry, Paul does it. Random motion with his fingers and she just automatically knows what he means. Turns out it's the Freeman people. Hey, that's the guy from his dream. Apparently he's supposed to become his mentor and best friend. And it's the big jaw guy from No Country for Old Men. You know, remember the arm guy? whatever. In order to prove themselves, they must fight. Now, Big Jaw Guy didn't know that the mother was useful. He said the boy can learn our ways, but the mother is too old to learn their ways. And then he's like, why did you say you were a weird and woman? How does that even make a difference? She's still too old. So does it mean that if she's a weirding woman, it doesn't matter how old she is, she can learn new ways? Or were you just being a jackass before? Well, this is where he meets the girl. Paul was like, wait a minute. That's the baddie that I keep dreaming about. Ooh, I got me a sand bitch. She claims I would not have let you hurt my friends. Well, you let him get pretty close to doing so. You will have your own molder pistol when you find it. Give it to me. Johnny, take charge of the new gun. This feels like Avatar. People that we know are our enemies that have just happened upon our land. Let's just automatically invite them into our fold and teach them all of our ways and their secrets about life, including where we live, how many of us there are, our skills, and let's train you to be just like us, not knowing anything about you. How wise. Okay, Jig Sully, this guy has a problem with this. He's like, bro, what are you doing? Like, what? am I the only person who has half a low brain here? Technically, the weirding woman beat you in battle and the strongest needs to lead, so I want to challenge you for the role. Big Jaw guy's like, I don't do this. This, is, this, is, this is not the time. Meanwhile, this guy's like, this is the perfect time. Let's do this. We need to. And apparently this mentor guy is a very good fighter and Paul has a vision that he is killed. The vision's narration says Paul Atreides must die for Hadarok to rise. I don't know how to say that name. I'm sorry. No matter how many times they say it. So I'm thinking he has to die and then be brought back to life, right? Where's the Outworlder? <laughs> this feels just like Avatar. And I know Avatar probably came after Dune was made. So was Avatar taking beats from this too? It's just weird, man. The same thing with Sute. So she's like, I know you're going to die, but take one of my knives because I feel bad for you. Why do his eyes look like he's always half asleep? So he already saw everything that this guy is going to do, right? But this guy's a very good fighter and he's his mentor. He's never killed anyone. So he refuses to kill the guy. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's the music. <laughs> Did not expect that to happen. I thought he was going to be his mentor. I thought he was going to be his friend. So I guess his dreams do change. They're not completely right. But this just, for whatever reason, this reminds me. Shit. 
like he's a piece of bread. And Paul is so sad. They're like, good job, man. That was awesome. <laughs> She's all like, damn, I thought you were like a little boy, but mm, you killed someone. They were tasting real good right now. Then everyone sees him as super strong, I guess. The mother wants to get off the world, but he's like, no, my place is here. Of course it is. I wonder why. And then we see someone in the distance riding a sandworm, one of the Thremen. And then she says, this is only the beginning. And his mother decides to stay with him because of course she does. And he's like, ooh, my future's with you. I'm not even, I'm not even rushing. I don't gotta riz you or anything because I already know you're gonna be my bitch. That's exactly what he's thinking. And he's like, mm, yes. And then the part one of this saga ends. What a freaking funny movie. I absolutely enjoyed this movie. Like despite me making fun of it, I absolutely enjoyed it. It was so sci-fi. There were a lot of inconsistencies in this movie that just made no sense. I feel like maybe stuff got lost in translation from the book. I never read the book. I don't plan on reading the books anytime soon. But some of the stuff was just downright confusing. It's a make. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like this, 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 certain things that could have been done better, certain things that were heavily convenient. But the aesthetic of it was very, very nice. If you like beige and gray and black, Anyways, thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulturi. You ask, we answer.